Evening, everyone. Hey, Eric. So last month we had discussed preparing requests for proposals for the Nettleton property yep. at 605 South Lexington Avenue as well as the former Rivermont School at 1011 North Rockbridge Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to start with Lexington Avenue and the Nettleton property and I'm just going to go over some highlights of what we've included in the draft RFP to this point um, to get a little feedback from you. So the property is currently zoned M1 light industry. Um, that's a pretty high use level, but it does afford lots of options for proposals. The site's just over three acres in size. Um, I think that's an important component that you realize how much land is there. The proposal is listed as commercial ownership or rental housing development request for proposal. That's the way we've titled this particular document um, and I believe that that leaves the door wide open with the high level of zoning we have that would afford any use listed in our commercial uses as well as anything listed in our light industrial uses there that you need to have that flexibility for proposals. Within it, we reserve the right to cancel the RFP or reject any or all proposals. So you, you're not tied to having to accept the proposal the way we drafted the document. Um, the proposal determination is going to be totally at the city's interest. If no proposals are determined to be in the best interest of the city, you don't have to do that. Um, and the city has sole discretion at the award as who is presenting the best proposal if they choose to award one. So we asked for experience, references, and an outline of services as part of the RFP process. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to know that we're going to get in with someone who can complete a project. And that's what we're trying to make sure we get that information done. Uh, we've listed the evaluation criteria for selection of proposals as developer experience scoring 25 points, quality of design scoring up to 25 points, marketing plan up to 20 points, and neighborhood support up to 30 points. Offers may be required to give an oral presentation to the selection committee. I think that's important too because you can hash out a lot of details that way. And so I'm going to move on to North Rockbridge Avenue unless someone has some questions, comments, concerns about the draft for that one. Okay. Very similar on this one. Mostly just the top two items bulleted because these are almost copies of each other. Uh, it's currently zoned R4. It's our most dense zoning district for a development. So it allows for multi-unit residential development. The site is to be determined in size after we determine where the boundary lines are for the parcels that are currently there. It's multi-parcel. In my estimation, there is a boundary line close to the edge of the playground, which we intend to retain but I think to have a surveyor determine exactly where that boundary is so we can tell you exactly how much land We're is We're going there. to have the same issue with having to group them together like we did with the Edgemont properties a while back? So you may or may not. They're already, they honestly should have been combined in single parcels. I believe that's something we should do before we convey a property. Um, instead of it being lot lines divided through the actual building like it is currently. It should have been done in the process a long time ago. So those are things we would clean up through the process. So as before, we've changed that just a little bit. This proposal is listed as ownership of rental housing development request for proposal. Because of the nature of the residential area, I don't believe that we would want a commercial application in this particular area. It's just not fair to the neighborhood. It doesn't fit with our current plan. Um, I think that we need to step away from commercial proposals in the area. Um, the rest of it's basically the same basis for award information that I went over on the last one. 
same criteria for selection. And that's basically that one for that. Does anybody have any questions about that particular draft? All right, if not, we'll probably be finalizing that and forwarding the draft out for review in the near future. Okay. Okay? Yes, sir. So we're going to move on to my second topic, the adoption of the Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan. Uh, so under the emergency management function, this is something that's uh, landed in my wheelhouse and uh, I participated in the Regional Committee at the Roanoke Regional Commission in uh, drafting this plan. Um, we gave input on the overall goals and objectives for the entire area and what I'm going to review is more the Covington specific material. So this is some statistics for Covington for repetitive loss. The numbers, I uh, did a little research, found out it rep it's representative of a rolling 10-year period anywhere between 1978 to date. Uh, that's the highest repetitive loss number within a rolling 10-year period from that date to current. And as you can see, there's some pretty high numbers here. They've made payments nearly $200,000 in total. Um, and so that leads us to why we want to reduce hazard through these mitigation goals and strategies. Many of these have been in our plan for a long time. Uh, goals mitigation of property damage from flooding. Public works is a lot of times responsible for our drainage projects and things, and that's why it's referenced in, the con in this plan. And then strategies include acquisition of residential and commercial properties in the floodplain. Evaluation of public utilities and buildings. Um, you know, delivery of services to citizens, therefore. Elevation of structures at the city playground and pool. This was already in the plan. I didn't remove it because in our last flood, the water got right up to the level of the pool. We're lucky it didn't get in it. Uh, drainage improvement areas. It lists several. Parish Court, Marshall Street, Rayon View area, West Jackson Street. All of these were identified in plan already. Always want to stay in good standing with the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, we do that <coughs> through our floodplain ordinance. Um, I'll probably be talking to you in the near future about an updated version of that and the state is updating their template for it as we speak. Uh, I've been in touch with our uh, DCR rep who handles that and we've been having discussions about that. So. Acquisition of flood prone properties again, drainage improvements, Craig Avenue, Royal Avenue. You just completed some of those. They weren't complete when we were working on this plan with the Regional Commission. Uh, development of information system for better planning, regulation, and response. That would be emergency services. It's the strategies of keeping our update and modernization of our flood insurance maps. And we have that uh, now on our GIS system. It can be tweaked just a little bit to show a little more accuracy. Um, that's something I'd like to see us improve upon slightly. And as you can see, GIS layers are listed in this presentation as part of that. Additional flood hazard data. Um, and so that's elevation certificates for um, certain structures in the floodplain, documentation that we keep and share with FEMA and the Department of Emergency Management. The addition of local iFlows monitoring stations. This has actually been, a, been evaluated by VDEM recently. Um, they've just completed a report on the iFlow system and um, they presented it to the governor. And the recommendations are modernization of the reporting equipment and additional monitoring stations. So we'll see where they go with it, but we want to support that initiative. It's an important thing to us to monitor uh, levels of the river. Uh, we've got an iFlow station down at Main Street Park. If you don't know what that big concrete mod thing is there, that's exactly what it is. It helps us know what, what's going on real time. So 
maintain accurate database of maps and repetitive lost properties. So we work with VDM and FEMA to do this, and a lot of it's through our reporting of damages, through emergency management, and when VDM uh, does damage assessments, we do them for with VDM most of the time in the event of a flood or any other type of disaster event, and we report up to VDM. And so they get all this information annually, and this is all a way that we submit that information to them. So mitigation of impacts of natural hazards. Public education is one of those biggest things. You know, we don't want to put things where they're going to be prone to the damage is one of the biggest things. Um, improvement of response capabilities for all hazards. Communications interoperability. That's always listed as the number one problem in disaster scenarios, communications. Our new radio system should make us much more interoperable. This was already listed in our plan. I didn't add this. So that's something we're currently working to resolve right now. As you can see, it had a system quoted in it, but we're going with even a more modern version that's quoted in this plan. That was about generators at shelters. Let me back up to that one. So at our sheltering uh, stations, we've just purchased two portable generators for use there. Um, they're better than what we had, which was nothing. <laughs> so we put them in, into storage here. We're buying uh, fuel tanks for them. They're dual fuel, propane. So we're trying to move toward making this a little bit better than it has been and, and working on this goal currently. Upgrade the weather terminal at the Covington EOC. This is just our way of monitoring situational awareness in an emergency operations scenario. Um, so currently we use lots of input from weather service we use lots of input from local news sources we use things that are available to us through vdm for monitoring and the weather terminal real world real time here at the building sometimes isn't available it sure would be nice to know accurate rainfall totals wind speeds temperatures all that monitored real time here uh, it's a little bit more of a better situational awareness tool it shouldn't cost but a very nominal amount it's something that i think we should do local codes and regulations that assist mitigation impacts from natural disasters this is all planned. local code and regulation review we're doing that right now uh, like i mentioned the floodplain ordinance that's something we need to update to make sure we stay current This is just a chart that shows all of them that I've discussed in flow. I'm not gonna spend any time on it. Just wanted to let you know that it's there in a more condensed version if you wanna review it. And with that, I should be <coughs> Does anybody have any questions about that? Yes. Yeah. So we'd ask that you add the adoption of that resolution to the agenda. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or my department about it. The full plan is available on the Roanoke Regional Commission website for you. All right, thank you. 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 Thank you.